thank you everyone for coming and thank you Central Cities and Montague Evans for having us. Uh, my name is Alex Rochaw, I'm Portfolio Holder for Regeneration Planning and Transport on the Bradford Council. Um, and I, I suppose um, from a politician's point of view I'll try to give you a bit of a, a view on, on what we've just seen. So a council leader um, and leadership uh, plays really a central facilitator role in, in civic leadership. Um, most organisations um, that you will ever deal with will have in common a relationship with the local council, um, even if it's a bad one, uh, they'll, they'll still have that relationship. And in a kind of uh, post-austerity age, um, facilitation of local authorities, leading that facilitation is going to be kind of a key role. So it'll be less leading from the front and more about facilitation. I think maybe in the first few years of austerity there was a feeling that maybe if we just hang on and keep trying to manage a bit of decline for a few years and then you have a change of government, the tax might turn back on and you can go back to normal. I think more strategically it was better at the start in 2010 uh, when we had to start dealing with cuts to local authority budgets that actually think strategically about what is the role of local authorities going forward. Now my instinct actually um, it's probably a bit more what you'd call old-fashioned command and control, or like pulling a lever from the centre and expecting good things to happen. Um, in the words of Ringo Starr in Yellow Submarine film, I'm a born lever puller. So I'll, I'll have a meeting with officers and I'll um, tell them what I want to see happen um, and think, oh, that's great, great day's work, and apologies to, <laughs> apologies to Martin Philip about his how councillors think, I'm afraid. We'll walk out of the meeting and say, I've just told them to deliver that on time and on budget, so that's a fantastic step forward. Um, and then you come back six months later and, and you're yanking the lever again and, and nothing's happening. And part of the reason of that is that you've got to work in partnership and, and you, you can't just pull the lever and walk away and expect change to happen. So facilitation in that regard means giving up a measure of control, um, which is hard for us politicians to do. Um, but working together actually to define those strategic outcomes that you want to see and then allowing those bodies to deliver those while you can kind of focus on the next task. So in Bradford we created the Bradford Economic Partnership, um, secured a private sector chair in David Baldwin who is the CEO of Burnley Football Club, but he's the CEO of the year as he likes to remind us at every meeting. Um, and that could help then oversee the delivery of an economic strategy for Bradford. Um, if it was just the council doing it on, it on its own, it wouldn't have had the buy-in. It wouldn't be us creating the jobs or delivering the economic growth. So you have to do it in partnership. And the economic partnership was a, a key element of that. And that then created a platform for public and private sectors to work together. And they were to be able to deliver place marketing uh, for Bradford, which was probably the first time really we'd had such a, a thing on that scale. And uh, business improvement districts are another kind of example of partnership um, that we invest in as local authorities. They're private sector led. Uh, but actually behind the scenes, often facilitated and seeded through local authorities. Um, and in Bradford districts, we've gone from just having one bid uh, in Keighley to three, uh, with two more in Bradford and Ilkley in the space of a year. So now we uh, have the most bids in West Yorkshire, which we like to remind uh, people of whenever we can. Of I know there's dozens in London, three for Bradford feels feels good. We're on the right path. Um, and then local partnerships also help move that narrative away, actually, from the council kind of being the key holder to everyone's success. That culture can still exist where people kind of want to do something but feel they need the council to, to be the delivery mechanism for that, and that's not really the case. Probably never has been, um, but the culture needs changing. So particularly, I think, when an area is struggling, we saw some of those uh, city centres uh, highlighted in that report. I think there's a risk too many people and organisations really view the council as that only route through which things can be changed and bids are an example for instance of how the business community can take a lead in how they can sort of shape the place of, of their, their bid area. Um, making a case at the moment for pooling resources into like a supra body that you might call a union of some kind, um, it isn't something politicians have been successful at lately, um, but actually it is really essential particularly for for local authorities and the evidence uh, as I understand it you know the places that have been doing it longer whether it's Greater Manchester or London they've forged ahead and shown that it works and places like say West Yorkshire combined authority we're really starting from the past few years whereas Greater Manchester has a really strong history of working together and delivering and at its core actually when we sort of say what can government do 
if you don't speak with one voice when you engage with government, then you, you will be at the races in the first place. Um, they don't have the bandwidth. Whichever government's in, in power, they won't have the bandwidth to try and kind of midwife a series of authorities that aren't on the same page. And there's more than enough authorities working together, delivering or putting forward their proposals where they all agree with each other, but they'll just focus on it. And that's especially true um, in a kind of Brexit landscape as well. So whether it's arguing for devolution and one Yorkshire, which is what we're pushing uh, in Yorkshire, or infrastructure like Northern Powerhouse Rail, uh, city leaders working together is an absolute precondition for success. Um, and that's probably particularly so in areas that haven't had the ear of government historically, um, and particularly in struggling areas where I think you can have siren voices sometimes that um, try and push you in a direction of almost stamping your feet a bit loud. You've not got what you deserved historically, so why are you almost pushing against more successful neighbours rather than working together? And all that happens then is the funding will flow past you and not through you because you, the government will want to see partnership working. Um, so for Bradford, for instance, we support the Transpennine Rail upgrade. It's a major piece of infrastructure for the rail east-west connectivity. But the benefits to Bradford are probably relatively ancillary, actually. Um, but by doing that and in working with West Yorkshire, all the West Yorkshire authorities support Bradford having a city centre stop on Northern Powerhouse Rail which would be the biggest sort of transport infrastructure investment in our district we've had. And that was a, a bit of a pipe dream at first when we started back in that case, but we've worked in partnership and, and build that, and now Transport for North are doing some modelling work on how that can work. And um, it's personally supported by the Transport Secretary, Chris, Chris Grayling, on that basis he's a wonderful person, and I would not <laughs> hear a word said against him at this event. He's very tall as well. He, he, he's a very tall man, so uh, when I met him I was tall, so that was alright. <laughs> <laughs> Bit of a power move on him, but he was, he was very good. Uh, he's very behind Bradford. Um, and then also you've got partnership organisations and core cities, I think, are meeting downstairs, and key cities in Bradford is, is an organisation who wants to play a leading role in. And those allow you to kind of influence the policy debate on a national level. So you get that district level where you're working with business improvement districts, you're working with your local economic partnership, you have the regional level of city regions, and then you get those national bodies as well, and they're all uh, heavily important. With regards to how government can support cities, um, in my view, speed up devolution and stop penalising those areas that don't have it yet, actually. Um, government bandwidth, as I've said, is soaked up with Brexit, and that means it's kind of stalling on devolution. Um, but the problem is, is in the interim, funding deals like transforming cities um, enforce a bidding process for areas without that kind of dev devolution package with a mayor attached. So places like Greater Manchester will get tens of millions of pounds direct, they'll start spending, they'll just crack on with delivery. Um, whereas West Yorkshire Combined Authority, we go through a bidding process with strings attached for a smaller amount of money. And that soaks up our own bandwidth as well, so our officers are working dozens, hundreds of hours putting together bidding processes that we might not succeed in whilst other areas of the mayorality charge forward. Now the reason the government wants to do that is because they're trying to push places to say well we'll have a mayor in devolution but then they can't get the devolution deals over the line so they're punishing us for not being able to deliver what we've already says we'll, we'll gladly have. Um, and the time scales the government operates to are in, uh, pretty tactical, it's usually aligned to some sort of political time scale which as a politician I kind of have a sympathy with. Um, but it's not nearly strategic enough. So transforming cities is a great example. Um, delivery deadline of 2023. So to transform your city, you've got four years. And if you give us till 2023, we we'll, can deliver a, a dedicated bus lane. But if you give us till 2033, we can have a regional mass transit system across the city region. So you've got to have the confidence to see past the next election deadline, which is easy for me to say. Um, but my election's next year, so. I'm Okay, I think it's crossed out. So ultimately, whether it's your, your local level uh, with economic partnerships or bids, national level through key cities, working together is an absolute precondition for success and city leaders are central to that, but only through facilitation and partnerships because leaders work best when we pull them together. Okay. The fact we've only got seven minutes, I'll stick to it and then we'll get into a much more important discussion. I thought I might do two things. Just broaden it out slightly um, and give you a sense quite practically of probably the five elements I see as critical to delivering a kind of economic outlook which is going to be sustainable for our, our cities, our towns and our regions. 
but then narrow it right down into autobiographically what we're trying to do at the moment with our city centre environment in Coventry, if I may. So I'll do that very, very quickly and I'll go, anyone that knows me, I'll go 100 miles an hour, I'll try and be controversial, whip you up into some kind of mild frenzy. Um, and then leave. And then leave. Um, five things then, and by all means challenge me in the discussion, um, that I think are, are required um, in order to deliver something more coherent than we've seen in many of our towns and cities uh, so far. Number one, an absolute compelling authentic narrative for the place. And I do not mean some kind of branding imagery set of storyboards for our places. I mean a genuinely embedded asset-based sense of why our place, whether it be Birmingham, Swindon, Bradford, Coventry, where, why we are differentiated both on a, a regional, national, and also an international basis. And if I told you that 10 years ago, when we started thinking in Coventry and I arrived about our own authentic narrative, economic narrative of our place and what it meant, the two things happened. Number one was the assets that we had, which were quite frankly being hidden, but also denied as liabilities and deficits, needed to be brought out. For example, this great city we're in now, I made it very clear, despite the history of antagonism between Coventry and Birmingham, get over it. How gifted are we economically in terms of our communities to have our second city less than half an hour away with all the assets it has, which Coventry never needs to have or wants to have, and less than an hour away from uh, London, our only global city. Bang on. Bring it on. Tell the story of those assets around you that are either hidden or denied. And the fact that when I and brilliant political leaders generally in our city in Coventry launched the economic narrative, as important, more important than the leaders of me being on the stage, we were shared, almost elbowed off by the chief executive of Seven Trent, FTSE 100 company, chief executive of Jaguar Land Rover, the highest export company in the UK, vice chancellors of the two universities, community voluntary sectors, saying actually this is not about the story of the local authority, it's about the story of the place. So number one, authentic narrative for place. Number two, boring but necessary, coherent strategies. I'm fed up with the notion of tactical serendipity of just grabbing stuff, this vulgar race for the latest funding stream, this vulgar race for, I'll have one of those because someone down the road's got one of them, has actually frustrated and made some of our growth regressive and lack coherence in our places. So, the fact that, again, I can only speak about what we're trying to do in Coventry, the fact that, yes, we did win UK City of Culture was not a tactical piece of serendipity. It was part of a 10-year cultural strategy and the an ambition and aspiration to win that was literally year five. That is the important thing because then politicians and others can have the confidence beyond election cycles that we're going to stick together, pan politics across our city to be able to deliver those kind of opportunities. So narrative, strategy, number three, meantime approach. We are appalling at this in my view, in this country. And there's some examples of where we're doing it better. If you look across Scandinavia, North America, and Europe, they outperform us every time. Whilst we're delivering this amazing, compelling vision and this incredible strategic approach to delivering a more prosperous, sustainable place, we end up forgetting that the inevitable disruption of cranes on the sky, diggers on the ground, creating a new world, and much stuff which is not seen necessarily because it's under the ground, but provides a kind of infrastructure for future prosperity, fibre, proper heat line distribution to go carbon neutral. How do we tell the story of that to our people in the meantime? Because the best one it was, great as our politicians are and our developers and our partners, it's going to take 10, 15, 20 years to regenerate and reimagine our places in the way that we all want. So what do we do year on year? You grab things but only as part of the overall strategy and the compelling vision is my point. Number four, it's going to sound like I'm being particularly obsequious to politicians because I've got Alex next week, but it's true. Not always sexy to talk about. If you're going to win this, you need bold political leadership and bold place leadership. And this means you need to know when to place shape and place make. It's when you know you need to place shield and protect your place in fierce terms and evidence terms from some of those vagaries of central government, just heard about them, or other major toxic shocks that your place gets. Whether it be social care, high demands on some of the most challenged parts of your communities, but also when to let go, and when other partners are better on that stage than you are. So number four, you've got to have bold innovative leadership. And you know, risk management and investment and infrastructure and working with developers, where quite frankly, it's a fundamental reimagination of what risk looked like for the public sector in the past. We've changed fiscally, financially, it can't be the same model as before. And then finally, it does link the, just if I have a few minutes left on the city centre in Coventry. Everything, fifth point, is about connection, 
convergence and systems playing out as ecosystems that are live. They are not on spreadsheets, they're not some kind of virtual reality. These are places that are living. So the only way you'll be successful on those other four ingredients, in my view, is to actually have an ecosystem of which transport, housing, um, the sustainability agenda, employment, growth sectors, leisure, amenity, activation, all of those things come together to try and go to where people are at, not where you expect them to be. So they're the five things I said. Have I got two minutes? You have, I'll give you two minutes. So if you believe even some of that as ingredients, you're then down to what is here and now. Coventry, bombed in the Second World War, had a heady responsibility in urban planning, regeneration to reimagine its city centre. In the 1950s, everyone's gone to Coventry recently will find this hard to believe. People come from all over Europe to look at the first truly coherent pedestrianised city centre in Europe. 70 years on, we've got a heady responsibility to reimagine our city centre for the next generations. And we've already heard it brilliantly from that synopsis. It will not be anchored on retail. And in case anyone hasn't noticed and has been somewhere cocooned in um, some outer reaches of Iceland, retail has tanked, and it's for a whole variety of reasons. Our future high streets will be about everything we heard. It will be an ecosystem of working, co-working. The idea of the old Roman sense of forum, arena, people coming together, doing two things at once. Amazing connectivity through digital, the likes of which you've never seen before. But also this visceral way of actually dealing with people exchanging ideas and actually above all in my view experience animation and activation so you've got to find a way of bringing everything from public realm lighting spaces in between buildings the way in which you transport people in and around your city centers in a way which is about experiential not product not transaction but experience and my final point on this that all sounds great but how do you do that? And Coventry is a good example because we're trying to put a £350 million development together to knock down our city centre and try again. How do you do that when the development market, the equity players, debt restructuring, all of that goes against those kinds of different anchors of how you create prosperity and livability in your city centres? So we're all up against it. And the greatest will in the world, and the greatest respect to central government and others, just a bit of money coming out of a high street fund is not going to be able to reimagine those economic living heartlands of our towns and cities. We need to go back to those five ingredients. Because finally, everyone, my view on this, and it does worry me, it is really topical at the moment to talk about our city and town centres. And I get it, for all the evidential reasons we've heard. But if we're not careful, if we suck that out and isolate it from wider industrial strategies, wider industrial strategies, wider housing strategies, wider abilities to understand how people live their lives in very difficult circumstances at the moment, then what it will be is a really interesting set of debates, but completely disconnected from the bigger ecosystem that makes towns and cities what they are in the UK. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Martin. Um, I can't um, agree enough with you, Martin, um, about the need for strategy, about the need for the, for the whole piece, about the need for integration of planning, transport, <coughs> placemaking, not just about the town centres, about how the whole, about your whole city feeds your town centre, enriches it, and makes it grow. And Marty, for your five, I'll see, you, I'll see you and raise you two. I'm up for seven, That's so, so I'll speak. So <laughs> uh, number one I, uh, is exactly what yours. I'll be very clear about what your priorities are and what your strategies are. In Swindon, we have 30 pledges. Um, that that direct, comes directly down from the vision and also articulate it very clearly to our residents so they've got full disclosure, we're fully accountable and residents and partners can also, also uh, embrace that vision and be part of it and be very clear and own it and be strategic in that vision. We talk about, as we said before, the transport, the housing, the business, all in, all in a great big um, holistic piece. Um, second part, enable your partners. Again, it's about knowing your town well, knowing your vision, and knowing the assets that you have in the town. Um, an example is our Switch On to Swindon network. This is a, um, a pump primed by Swindon Council. Uh, we've built up 600 uh, business ambassadors in Swindon, all of whom have a common purpose to promote Swindon as a place to live and to invest. The expertise that you get from those 600 ambassadors, you can't buy that. Uh, their expertise, their passion and their great articulation of the need for business is a real asset in itself. Um, great presentation at the head of this meeting and it, I say it's great because it picks up on all the sort of our areas of concern and if you come onto the skills base which is a huge part of building, building the city place. 
Um, Switch on to Swindon started with a talent attraction campaign to address the skills needs that are articulated within the network. Through further talking and further understanding, um, it's now sort of honed down into tech Swindon. We found out that the, 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 the skills that our businesses need are tech, are digi, uh, we've got a burgeoning sector in VR, in AI. And so uh, from, a, from a broad talent attraction campaign, using those ambassadors, we've now designed a smart year-long tech swindling campaign that should hopefully um, bring people in, upskill those people and match skills to the businesses that we have. Number three, unlock and utilise your assets. Swindon, like I'm sure, like all the towns and cities here, are full of absolute jewels. Um, map your assets, be aware of them, look at your leverage, look at your partners. Good example in Swindon, uh, we have some beautiful heritage buildings in our arrival quarter in the railway quarter. Um, the, the railway carriage works owned by Network Rail, right adjacent to a very nice income generating car park owned by Swindon. We land swap this, uh, much to the horror of our finance people. Uh, worked with the one public estate to do feasibility and to bring that building in. And talking to our ambassadors and our businesses, identifying the need for startup and growth micro businesses and workspace in this amazing heritage building. It's also part of a great narrative with the heritage and the future, the Digitech and uh, Swindon's great railway history. Uh, number four, leverage with your key players in the town. Um, again, moving down from the carriage works, we, um, Swindon's a rail town, we have a railway station that works perfectly well. There's no um, transport incentive to put money into, it's working very well. From December, we'll be 50 minutes from London. There's an opportunity there for a key gateway into the town. Um, it's network rail land, again working with one public estate. We're looking at developing ideas to bring that, bring that, to that, that whole piece of land and the whole um, asset into investment readiness. Again, working with Partners Network Rail have their Open for Business um, channel. Um, so we can put through our investment opportunities, maybe five, maybe 10, maybe 15 years in the future. But having Network Rail and Great Western Rail and the operator all as part of the mix, understanding how we can bring piecemeal and incremental improvements in terms of bus and rail integration with those big strategic investment um, pitches is working really well for us. We've got high hopes of what we're doing in early stage with the one public estate to look at the site. Uh, number five, collaboration with government. Um, we've had some great benefits from working uh, closely with government. Again, because it's probably close in our mind, the uh, Highways Infrastructure Fund has been challenging for a lot of us. But what it has started to do is to start us to think about co-production, co-development of schemes with government, um, and also to consider the challenges. Our Homes England have come out and said quite, quite openly that that, that that process has been challenging. And it's given a great opportunity for us to be proactive with government, and um, that's what really Point 0.5 is about, is being proactive with government, um, offer solutions, offer lessons learned, work with them to improve the process for next time and also make those government partners as familiar with your problems in the city as you are. Um, there are regional government officers that we work extremely well with, with Bayes, with One Public Estate, with DFT, with MHCLG. Make them know your narrative. That narrative doesn't just work for businesses and strategic partners. But number six is working in your city networks in the more formal and the more informal. Again, to build capacity, to get that wider transport and that wider planning capacity to think as a city within a region. So Swindon is now part of England's economic heartland, um, which follows the, uh, broadly the Oxford to Cambridge Expressway and beyond. Actually stretches from Swindon pretty much to Ipswich now, as the formative subnational transport body. Um, what a huge opportunity to understand scheme development and capacity stretching. Um, you were speaking about bidding process and how constraining they are and how short term they are. Building a strategy for the wider region really builds the strength in your own town and, um, and looks for more innovative ways to, to, to uh, develop your schemes. We're working with partners to, um, to pull resources on business, business case development and incorporating more lessons learned and evaluation into the process that we simply don't have the capacity to do as cities, uh, uh, as Swindon on our own. Uh, but we're working cross, cross borders and further, further west and east than we would do normally. 
The more informal networks are probably just as valuable, and Andrew will, will know that we're part of the fast growth cities, that they do a lot of work with centre for cities, so that's Milton Keynes, Norwich, Oxford, Cambridge and Swindon. Again, that spine of the Oxford to Cambridge, potentially expressway, but also um, east-west rail, the whole sort of corridor of movement, don't like to talk of it as just an expressway. The fast growth cities has given the opportunity to think of it not just as a corridor, but, ha but consider those cities and how, how they interrelate and how you get in and out of those cities. What are the common problems and what are the common issues? Uh, we've got an event coming up on housing supply and affordability. It's been incredibly useful to talk to uh, partners and also at the National Infrastructure Commission who are talking to us later on. Again, about, about alternative ways of financing, tax increment funding, land value capture, and uh, I was also talking to a colleague in Plymouth about crowdfunding. Um, and also more informal partnerships. At, for example, at Birmingham are kind enough to host us a couple of months ago to talk about the economic benefits of the canal. Because we have quite a, quite a strong canal history as well in, uh, in Swindon, and how to realise those benefits and make that place. And the last pillar is uh, using your to the tools at your disposal to leverage more results. Especially as a planning authority, we've had some success with local development orders. That's to bring forward, in the, in the, the case of 30 sites, the sustainable energy um, companies. Um, but also looking at what we can do to enable broadband, 5G and also um, EV mass usage by uh, going through the planning considerations in housing. So, yeah, so we've touched on the skill base, we've touched on uh, developing the the city and upgrading the transport put the city in the context of the wider regional piece. Raise your hands in the usual way, say who you are, uh, you can ask your question uh, and I will pass it on to the panel. Hands. Yes. So we've got one there, I'm going to look for a couple, so just bear that in mind. So we've got another one there, and I'm ideally like to do things in three, but we'll take two from it. Just say who you are, Jane, and then uh, your question. Uh, Jane Crow from When you have these devastating announcements such as Ponder, you know, in, I'm based in Wales, and you know, Ford closing, we've got several industrial coaches. You mentioned that you're 90 minutes away from London, but the Swindon is a post industrial town, the city. Then, um, do you think your alignment and, and there, there is a, an option for cities with a post industrial base um, to kind of have a plan to deal with you know, the, the change to the knowledge economy and is that part of your plan you know, to deal with these obviously constant devastation of changing the industrial levels? Great question and, a, and a, you know as everybody knows an issue that places are fun, you know since some of their, their heritage the reason they are where they are and what they are was because of their rich manufacturing and production parts and much of that is going or has gone away. And how you deal with the transition is absolutely critical. It's a great question. Yes, yes. Okay. Um, show out who um, you are. Helen Marl from the City Council. Um, it's a question for everybody, really. You, all three of you talked about the importance of a vision and a strategy and having something to, um, to, to guide you throughout the process. I'm interested in um, the engagement side of that. So how did you engage with the public, with the residents? Um, you know, and, and what, what would you say was your sort of key takeaway from that engagement process? Okay, in no particular order, Philippa, uh, yeah. you go for it. So, big shocks, how to respond, post industrial, doubling down, moving on, how do you do that? And then we'll come to that second question about engagement or vision. All right, um, just on a point of order, so we're 50 minutes away from London, not that. <laughs> so I've got my narrative. Okay. Um, yes, obviously, I uh, can't comment too much on Honda specifically at this point because they're barely out of consultation. But, um, you extrapolate that into, into the, sort of, uh, the sort of approach you would normally take, then obviously it's understanding that supply chain and again talking to people like your business ambassadors and understanding what the, what the business picture looks like and looking for those opportunities, which is how we identified um, those growth sectors, those, those digi and those tech businesses to go into the, into the carriage works um, to sort of cluster and build, which is already, already showing fruit. And you know, it really is about sort of listening and looking to your micros and your startups and looking for those clusters and, and helping them to burgeon um, and to diversify your economy and make your economy dynamic. Why? I mean, in some respects, the two questions are linked, don't they? In the sense, is how, you know, particularly Coventry, rich 
manufacturing past, rich manufacturing present, but there is more to the place, and part of the story is actually cultivating that and bringing people with you, in a sense, not harking back. Just say a little bit more about so, what you've been doing and how, so how you respond. Try on that specific point. The issue about the narrative, and I was very outspoken about this when I arrived in Coventry, economically and in terms of social history about post-industrial places, there's no point being passively nostalgic about the days of everybody working for Massey Ferguson and Jaguar Land Rover and Triumph. It's just, there's no need for that. You need to be respectful about where you come from and project it into a very good world. So the fact that evidence is everything, boring for some, but despite some of the challenges we're seeing at the moment in automotive, not least as we've just had on Honda, Jaguar Land Rover, the, the, the lack of grip and pace post-diesel gates with electrification, etc., etc. The evidence is, in my neck of the woods, in Coventry and arguably the wider region, there has been higher value job creation through the knowledge economy, through University of Warwick, Warwick Manufacturing Group. Every person that um, goes through Coventry University Design School, in effect, has got their hands on next generation Aston Martins and Jaguars, right? So the fact that I can't give you pictures of everyone with their flat caps coming out of the factories, that's gone. We've now got an amazing value proposition. But the point here is, and it's already sort of been mentioned by Philip, but you've got to understand your supply chain. I'm absolutely gutted when I hear and see places that get these toxic shots and they're scrabbling around for the deep impact of not that loss and that decision, which sometimes, by the way, is made way outside of your place, outside of the country. They don't understand the <coughs> endemic link ecosystem of that yeah. to the housing market to the rental market, not just the purchasing of houses, to actually everything you're trying to bind them into your story. And they're kind of surprised and shocked. And then the final bit on this has to be, I think Comedy learned its lessons and we're better now, you've got to balance out your economic um, futures. Because the idea of moving towards single sectors, because of this passive stuff, yeah. you've got to broaden out and get over the fact that the real value now in economies, whether it's Bradford, comes from those sometimes hidden assets. <coughs> We're going to bring your heritage, your culture, your service environment, the hospitality sector, and a raft of other emerging sectors to the fore, but in an authentic way, not making up a lot of the evidence. And then whilst I'm, you know, I'll shut up, but around the engagement piece, the best example for us, which is bearing fruit, is not economically, but the cultural strategy for Coventry was based on 350 separate engagement activities, what I call the unusual suspects. The trick is how the learning points, how do you keep those very people? The politician keeps saying to me, they're the people that no, no one ever listens to. How do you stay true to them when you have the most life-changing moment when you win the UK City of Culture and remember the reason the strategy emerged was through their eyes, not yours, and stay true to them as you develop a programme which resonates for them, not some kind of international expertise. Yeah. So yeah. That's, that's a learning moment. Alex, you're a politician, obviously, in a sense, part, you know, a significant element of your job is bringing people with you. How do you do that? I mean, again, rich heritage in Bradford, you know, wonderful past, sometimes feels like it, you know, holds back progress and, uh, and transition, but just say something about that engagement, how you do it. Yeah, so, um, it's something we talk about quite a lot, actually, it's something we talk about to our offices, because the problem with consultation, in a sense, is it takes time and money to do really well, and when you've got a project to a tight deadline and a budget, the first thing you kind of start to squeeze down is, well, if we just narrow down that, because you kind of know what you want to do anyway, let's be honest. Um, and you can kind of try set up consultation, so you're trying to get the answers you, you think you want. That's always a danger. Um, and I think there's a real switch in expectation how people expect to be engaged nowadays. Um, and therefore, even a traditional method of consultation I don't think works the same way anymore. Um, particularly from your kind of articulate, maybe your, your influencers rather than just the wider public. So you'll have different types of stakeholders and you'll always have those quite local, um, maybe for want of a better term, type of hipster type co-working people, very clued up, very keen, we call them like Bradfordcuts for Bradford if they want to articulate for Bradford. Um, and they need to be engaged in a different way. Um, we've got a markets project which is uh, pretty pleased with our presentation actually on what you need to do because we're doing quite a lot of it. So taking out retail space is quite redundant, replacing it with residential and public square. Um, and part of that will be a new market square as well, a um, new market hall. Um, and there's a place panel on the Civic Society, we took it to them, but they were kind of looking for a very deep, long consultation process, whereas the time we had in that case was just like, well, tell us what you think and, 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 and that's as much as we can do at this stage. We then launched an online consultation and we've got general public response was over a thousand people, so there was that interest there. Um, but we're just thinking about now our next kind of 20-year vision. 
um, and how we kind of bring the public with us on that because it will have to be you know, sort of bottom up, can't be top down. Like yeah. I say sometimes that's my instinct. So it's like, of course you all agree with me because I've put forward this fantastic plan. Yeah. It'll work like that. Yeah. Um, so it's, it's kind of in that kind of phase of what do you do? Do you do a, a Congress uh, type thing? Citizens' assemblies is obviously something that's being discussed a bit more nowadays, which I, I kind of find fascinating. It seems to have worked well in Ireland. Um, I know it's been discussed by Warren Stewart in the Conservative leadership debate, and it seems to have confused his colleagues a bit. I think it's a very communist idea or whatever. But um, so I think you have got to change. You have got to think outside the box. Um, but the almost the key sometimes is making sure you don't have that kind of free for all where it can kind of be taken over by not so much special interest groups, but perhaps small numbers of people who are very passionate who can turn up to everything. How do you reach those people who are ignored and, and are actually just quite interested? That they've got their own lives. They can't come to a one o'clock. Uh, consultation event because they work. Because so they work. Yeah, how do you exactly. reach those? Yeah. That is like a perennial yeah. question. Yeah. Yeah. Question. So again, yeah, one year and then one the front. You go first. So just shout out who you are and then. Hi, I'm Julie Crea from Living Streets. We're the UK charity for the walking. Um, we are very interested in the place and we wonder what sort of evidence and support do you need from organizations like ourselves that work with third sector, that are work with government. Um, Work with communities. So, what what would help in terms of making the case, making the exactly. argument for investment or changes to the urban form? That's a very good question. Yeah. Thank Shout you, out. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Campbell, Birmingham University. My expertise lies in city strategies and comparing case studies around the world. Mm -hmm. My question is uh, uh, culture as a part of city strategy, and also in the wider definition of culture in terms of creativity, innovation which leads us to the high-tech industry in one hand and actual cultural activities, uh, including education and so on. Would you say that uh, the definition of culture and the uh, mechanism of implementation of city strategy will more and more include the elements of creativity even in the setting up the uh, strategic priorities? But also, I would like to see when, how, in the case that is presented today, the culture could be a driving force to economic development and, and sustainable development. Very good. Uh, just for those in the room, we are doing a big piece of work on the role of amenities in economic performance level, but also at the city scale level. How do we kind of incorporate that in? What's your thinking on that? Okay. Uh, just briefly, if I can come back on the other point. If it, if do, right the, do the creativity one first. All right. Sorry. Okay. Time is against us. All right, so uh, it's, a, it's a timely question. Um, like I'm sure a lot of people, we have an um, unsuccessful heritage lottery fund bid for a new museum and art gallery. That potentially has done us a favour and has helped us to think about, again, this thing in a, more, in a broader sense. <coughs> and to look at a cultural offering that stimulates economic growth in the area. So again, we're going back to our one public estate partners, to our, to our government landowners, like the Ministry of Justice, DWP, health partners, looking at the town assets and seeing if we can forge a route to, to have a wider cultural offer, uh, which involves a dispersed public art, increased public realm, and that broad offer that will drive um, economic development through placemaking with a cultural outcome as well. Um, just touching on the sort of knowledge economy and, and some challenges related to this. Swindon doesn't have a university. Um, but the way that, that higher education is now mutating is again playing very strongly into, into the narrative of um, our burgeoning tech sector, um, dispersal of assets, and potentially having higher education facilities which use those tech skills um, to, to work with the creative industries um, to, to create. Um, Sort of uh, what we've got, we've got Architectural College, we've got um, uh, Cultural Heritage Institute, Arche um, Archaeological uh, Institute, all interested in hubbing, using tech, and there'll be some very good sort of cultural outputs from that as well. So it's the way that the way that economic development is mutating through tech and culture, I think it's playing really well to some of the challenges at Swindon and two other towns face. Okay, very good. Alex, a final thought from you on uh, making the case, you know, you Talk, you started with the business community, you were primarily talking about, not exclusively about the business community of kind of Bradford and West York's. Step outside of that, you know, in a sense, what would make a difference in terms of making the arguments to or drawing in uh, investment and interest and engagement from the business community more generally? Um, I don't think I've heard the right answer from that, so in, in a 
brevity of time, I'll give you just uh, I'll just back, back to it. Yep. Um, but I think sometimes there's a bit, in terms of innovative, we live in streets and, and we do some work within streets and you think about the healthy streets principles that are spread in London, different types of place making. Um, I think sometimes you, you, you get a feeling that for the big mega cities it's a bit easier because there's an impression that these cities are a bit further ahead. The economy is strong enough to kind of almost take a bit more of a risk. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you're in a different setup, it's like, well, that works fine for Leeds, but wouldn't it work for Bradford? And you kind of got to overcome that quite a bit. And that's sometimes from your own internal stakeholders as well. You kind of lifting aspirations locally and saying, no, it, it will work and, and we should have those ambitions as well. Um, but just on the culture, I mean, absolutely, it's, it's a key key part of, of where you go now. One of the things I missed out on uh, what I said was that I've been mean, working in partnership with secured uh, money from government's non powerhouse cultural fund for um, a former Bradford OG and NEC group, obviously based in Birmingham, will operate it. Um, and that'll drive 300,000 people a year to the city, um, 4,000 capacity music culture <coughs> venue. Uh, but as we try to build an office base in Bradford and strengthen that, actually having a strong cultural offer is an absolute. <laughs> determinant for that and we know unless we strengthen that cultural base we will actually be able to remodel yeah. the city centre. Excellent. Um, I think it's striking and we the three today but you see this in other places. It's, it is striking in places like Swindon and Bradford and Coventry and, and others. You know this sense that um, you know, they are increasingly making and shaping the market and the, and the outcomes that they desire and not waiting. I think that's a real, can you, I, we observe this in you see places that are much more dynamic and have become much more dynamic and, and engaged in doing those things and rather than just waiting for stuff to happen or be kind of you know, at the end of the queue that you eventually get to when everything else has been exhausted. I think that's been a noticeable trait um, and characteristic that we see in lots of different places. Anyway, uh, join with me to thank our three uh, panellists, Alex, Martin and Philippa. There is fresh coffee just coming in, which is obviously a tight room, so I appreciate that. If we can get a coffee or uh, a Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm here on behalf of Midlands Architecture and the Designed Environment, which is far too long a name, so it's usually known as MADE. We're the region's architecture centre, and we have a host of the region's best and most experienced practitioners in architecture, planning, landscape and sustainability, giving their time to improve the quality of outcomes through a design review panel and through project assistance to those local authorities who request it. My own experience is very close to home today. I was head of city centre planning here in Birmingham through the 90s, delivering major projects <coughs> such as Brindley Place and the Bull Ring, as well as a programme of environmental works, uh, breaking the concrete collar of 60s road building and presenting the city's streets, squares and canal sides as an attractive environment for a wide range of new activity. Subsequently in planning consultancy, I've been involved with further major change here in Birmingham, within the wider region, including the Frygate scheme in Coventry, and also in other UK cities. So, speaking as someone who operates based here in the Midlands, what have we learnt over the last 30 years or so? And I'm just going to stick to three things, I think, just to keep the, the pace down a little bit. Uh, lesson one, I think, is we've learnt that city living works. Our industrial cities did become polluted, unattractive places. So it's not surprising that greenfield housing, out-of-town business and shopping became popular. But in Birmingham, Coventry and other Midland cities, we've always had housing very close to our city centres. We've never really experienced those shatter zones that you see in cities like Liverpool. Um, with positive, people-focused environmental change and with planning policies that have been shifting from the American car-based model to more urban, mixed-use, European principles, our city quarters are becoming attractive places to live again. Here in Birmingham, we've got a fantastic example, the Jewellery Quarter, which has matured over 30 years to provide a truly characterful urban lifestyle. <coughs> Here in Birmingham, canal sites provide the view from many urban apartments. There's been over 20,000 new apartments in Birmingham city centre over the last 20 years, as well as providing space for jogging and cycling. City living, with its close proximity to work, cultural, social and retail activities, is attractive 
to young people, but also to older people. And I think we've only just started this urban regeneration and intensification process. And as we start to <coughs> tackle vehicle emissions and urban greening, our city centres and the inner urban areas around them can be even more attractive for families as well as smaller households. Um, lesson two, uh, good environment is good business. This is a lesson that was well understood when um, London's urban squares were laid out quite a while back. And when Brindley Place was developed here, we hoped, uh, rightly as it turned out, that an attractive new square as an address could attack, attract new business tenants. So um, what I'm seeing is that throughout the Midlands, changes, and sometimes quite small ones, uh, that alter the perceptions of an urban place are succeeding in changing reality because they're drawing in new investment and they're improving the lives of residents. Uh, my third main lesson is this stuff just doesn't happen by itself. It needs to be thought through and it can take quite a lot of time. Uh, although not everyone always understands how to achieve the best results, I think it's now widely understood that urban renaissance is a complex exercise requiring often site-specific solutions rather than any quick fix. I think we now appreciate that urban development, urban redevelopment, is more expensive and more inherently risky than building on green fields, building on uh, uh, farms and business parks. And we need to calibrate financial and political expectations accordingly. But I think we also now understand that it makes sense to achieve better use of our existing transport and other infrastructure that we have in our cities, the established local services, and perhaps most important, the social capital that's inherent in the established communities that are already here. We don't need to reinvent this elsewhere. It's already here in our cities. And in terms of... Um, the best examples of urban change, I would say that at the heart of the best examples of positive urban change here in the Midlands is a commitment to quality. Because with that at the heart, our city localities can become truly special places which work for people as investors and businesses as well as for the citizens who live in or visit them. So I'm optimistic that in the Midlands we have cities that are on the right track for a positive future unless we forget what we've been learning. And talking about learning, I just want to finish with a few sort of personal reflections. I think it's very important to look at what others have been doing, not to just work in your bubble. Uh, and that really can change your mindset. Here in Birmingham, it's a long time ago now, but when we started doing the Broad Street Redevelopment Area, that we're now in the Convention Centre, the first five-star hotel in Birmingham, the Hyatt just over there, um, the city went out to America, we started marketing ourselves. The first shock was to realise that in America, Birmingham is known as a place in Alabama. It, they wouldn't even think of England. It puts you in your place. It starts you thinking about who else has been doing this around the world. And in Birmingham, in the late 80s, there was an exercise of looking around and realising that eastern seaboard US cities had gone through the same deindustrialization that we were struggling with, because it was very rapid here in Birmingham, uh, a few years ahead of us, and learning, not copying what they're doing, but understanding what worked, applying it to our place, that sort of thing is well worth doing. Another thing that's worth doing is really understanding how people in your own city view their place. And uh, one of the best learning lessons for me is something that actually uh, came from a German city, I can't remember the name of it, but they had a, a really interesting idea. It was that your city should be a place that your citizens would want to be visitors in. So you're treating your own citizens as, as first-time visitors. And I think that's a really good mindset uh, for the sort of thing, the sort of impressions you want to, to make. Um, because I suppose one of the messages here is we're changing the world from cities being places that people don't want to be in, that was the case 30, 40 years ago, uh, we're changing perceptions to something that, that is a positive perception that then becomes a positive reality. And I think that's the, uh, the learning that uh, MADE can help you with 
if uh, if you come to our door. Thank Brilliant. you. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Jeff. Hey. Um, I think. Well, thank you for inviting us here today. Um, I'm going to come talk a little bit more strategically first of all about some of the work that the NIC has been doing. For those of you who don't know, um, the NIC is looking forward to 2050. So it's looking at a strategic. Um, well thought approach um, which is heavily researched on how we can um, move forward and break away from a lot of the siloed thinking that was talked about earlier this morning not only on funding but how we deliver our infrastructure so everything from transport digital uh, resilience uh, for flood and looking forward to climate change and how do we reduce uh, co2 emissions um, so I've been working with the um, National Infrastructure Commission to help them set up their design group, which is the kind of next stage of their work. So um, what I wanted to kind of talk about was that, um, first of all, as a sort of somebody who's been in there to help them set up their design group, that I've witnessed firsthand the um, analysis and, and reporting that they've done to um, develop the, this assessment that has gone to government um, and we're waiting for um, a proper response on. But it sets out a um, pathway to um, how do we respond across the country to growing, growing populations, and um, particularly congestion and housing shortages. Um, it also recommends that city leaders should have the right powers and funding to deliver infrastructure strategies covering transport, housing and employment. And that means that if that recommendation is taken forward, that 43 billion of added investment should go to cities outside London in 2040. Um, so you might be thinking, well, you know, what has this got to do with city centres? So I'm now going to follow on with some of the studies that we've done since. So one of the studies we've done recently is on freight. And freight is a very successful industry. It delivers things to our shops and places. Um, every day, um, but it's going to be challenged in the future with air quality and congestion. So um, the freight report comes out and it recommends for the government to come to uh, get to zero freight emissions by 2050. It's really got to help uh, change the landscape for how things are delivered. So that means looking at local distribution centres, um, and that means that in the plan making that that, that needs to be in embedded into the way into the city centres and it also means looking forward to new technology and how we travel by car. So we really are beginning to see that um, the future is probably going to be e-bikes, e-cargo and the way that we move in cities is going to change radically and I think that those are things that aren't on the agenda at the moment but do need to, to, to come up. Um, the other thing that the NIC has been doing is they've been uh, working on a cities programme um, and how to support cities shape and grow for the future. So um, the evidence is, is that cities need more long-term investment. We've already heard that. Um, that there are too many different uh, funding streams. We've heard that too. A lot of wasted energy looking at those. Um, and restrictions limit the flexibility to design and implement long-term proposals. So at the moment, the um, Commission is working with uh, five cities uh, to identify and share knowledge and good practice um, and how to make the public transport networks more attractive to a new generation and how to integrate um, technology and uh, automotive buses and how will electric vehicles work in those places. So the focus for them at the moment is on managing traffic better new technology, designing housing and infrastructure together to make it a sustainable place rather than separating the two out and the, uh, supporting shifting to less polluting vehicles. Um, so they're working with West uh, Yorkshire Combined Authority, Liverpool City Region, Exeter, Basildon um, and they are also running a whole series of events across the country. And then to build on those building blocks which are about strategy and policy which are really clear recommendations they've now established a national infrastructure design group to look at infrastructure 
So a lot of people think the design is about the way things look, but it's not. It's about the way it functions. It's the, about the way that it's embedded in the place. And it's a multidisciplinary group, um, and um, we will be uh, setting together a set of design principles, which we hope will be taken forward in uh, nationally strategic projects, but other infrastructure projects as well. Um, because um, you know, design is not a bolt bolt on. So, what can that mean in our cities? So, I think particularly what can design bring to our cities? I think it's about bringing the right stitches, the right connection, so that places are seamless, that you can get from one place to another. It's about supporting those clusters, which might be around um, kind of economic activity and helping them find their identity within that place. Um, and I think it's also about an integrated environment and thinking holistically of how you work with all of your partners to bring together things like lighting so that at night you feel safe, but it does it, it you know it's it's not a, um, a security driven environment. Wayfinding so that you can find your way through places and navigate easily to where you're going. Um, it's also about embedding the local culture in place because there's no point going to all the cities and they all look very different. Um, so the kind of thinking on the uh, from the design group at the moment is that the principles will be design, uh, people focused. They'll be about ease of use and access, um, and they will be about local design and bringing things that belong to that place in the landscape. So that might be a big shift in the way that we think about our infrastructure. But that is the next building block that uh, the NIC is hoping to deliver to um, bring. Um, and encourage the kind of fostering and connectivity that makes our places work. Brilliant. Thank you very much indeed, Kate. Uh, Alan, thoughts from Morning Q. Um, I'm, I'm going to bring it back kind of right to where we started actually in Rebecca's fantastic presentation at the start. Um, we didn't do a QA and a with Rebecca, but um, that would be uh, really valuable to have her on at the uh, uh, at the end as well. She's shaking her head in the she's wrong way. No, she's, she's hiding in the she's, back corner. She's reluctant, but that's, that's not the point. No, like, you know, I can get it down here. Yeah, no, 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 I thought it was a fantastic presentation. And um, um, I was going to talk about purpose and uh, social value of investment, and then Martin stole my thunder on that as well. So um, <laughs> I'm, in a bit of I'm in a bit of trouble now. Um, so I was going to actually talk about how much is a smile worth. We've talked about industrial strategies and um, absolutely, when it comes to centre for cities and centres for towns, the economic strategy is vastly important, the jobs. Um, I'm not a fan of people who say, I've got a failing shopping centre, the solution is I'm going to build lots of flats above it, um, tick a box and then we're off. I, I just don't believe that's radical enough, I don't believe it's sustainable, I don't believe it gives a good uh, environment for residents there. Um, so I'm much more of a fan of jobs, and I would much rather see an affordable office policy than I would an affordable housing policy in certain places. Um, and certainly believe, uh, as Martin mentioned, we need some more radical taxation. And it's not about business rates. Monty gave us talk about that quite often. They're very good at it. But it's not about business rates. It's about that wider tax. Should you pay stamp duty if you're buying an apartment or um, if you're leasing some office space in, in, in a targeted town centre? And Rebecca um, mentioned those to start with. So the, the world's rapidly changing. It's quite scary in many places. Um, and one of the most fastest uh, aspects of that is how we communicate together. Um, and it's not just about online, but it's the physical environment, how we communicate at schools, how we communicate in the workplace, how we communicate in neighbourhoods. It's also fantastically exciting. I wouldn't like people to think, oh no, the town, you know, town centres, and I'm going to be more the centre of the town than the, the macro that our fantastic panellists have spoke about at the moment. But it's fantastically exciting too. It's, 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 it's a once-in-a-generation opportunity we have here, and we're all playing our part in it. Amazon, WeWork, other disruptors, um, we, we, you know, Deliveroo, whoever it might be, Spotify, they've been, they, you know, they're impacting not only the, uh, the online environment, but the built environment. Industrial revolution, if people don't know what that's coming down the line, you know, AI, all the different aspects, and millennials and Gen Z, our society is changing. If you don't know what Gen Z is, go and find out what Gen Z is. There's none of them in the room, but we're designing our place for our Gen Zs. So I would be getting into schools, getting into universities, getting them engaged in this. And the community that we need to consult with, it just can't be 
the people in this room, with all due respect, it needs to be uh, uh, about who's going to use that in the future. Um, so what does that revolution, and it is a revolution, it's not an evolution. Sometimes people just say, eh, this town centre stuff is just an evolution. Shops have been closing for years. Um, there's nothing new here, is it? No, but it is a revolution. When you put society Gen Z, when you put Industrial Revolution 4.0, when you put um, all the things that's happening online together, it is a massive revolution. And, and as Martin said, our, our investment models just aren't fit for purpose to, to drive the value out of that. You know, how will Samsung and Microsoft, these are two occupiers who have just taken new shop units. Yes, they're in London, but two new shop units in London. Very expensive shops, very prime locations. But they won't be, in, they won't be judging the success of that shop on sales. They'll be judging on customer satisfaction, on engagement, um, a different set of metrics. Not how much product did I sell from that shop, therefore I can get back to my rent. Completely different. And it won't be... Um, and how do, we, how do we really understand the commercial value? I'm a valuer, I was trained as a valuer. Um, how do we value the, you know, that great school in the community? The healthcare facility that's on our high street that we don't have to get in our car to go, that has a value. But are we really, um, when we're putting in a development appraisal together, um, do we really say, oh, you know, that's great, we've got some co-working there, that, that's all going to come together um, and be some value. It's very difficult, certainly for, for private sector investors, and there are lots of them in the public sector, to bring that model together. So valuation, it can't just be monetary. It needs to reflect what buyers and sellers trans transact um, properties at, but it has to be um, far, far longer term. And that's where placemaking comes in and place shaping comes in. And then, so that's why I'm, I'm, I would like to talk about how do we value that going forward? Because we're not doing it as an industry. And as, and, and, as uh, um, we discussed earlier, it's preventing money coming into our market. And it's preventing change happening um, and and that, that's concerning. So there is no shortage of data. We saw it again today. Thank you, Rebecca. You've got some fontastic data. Hence why Monty Gibbons likes to support centres for cities at events like this and in their general business plan. Um, that data is so important. Um, so we've got lots of data, but we have to use that data in a way that can help us um, make decisions and, 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 and be confident. Some of these decisions are going to be very, very radical. And that's where valuation again comes into it. So the, so the cha challenge is uh, using uh, data to monetize decision, and perhaps more importantly, allowing the public sector. Um, and the public sector is the glue in this conversation. Employment's great, and employment's essential, um, and jobs and taxation and, and, and all of the other civic uses. But the glue to bring this all together is still going to be the public sector. They have the leadership. They have the long-term view. They can look over health education, crime, um, mainly the local authorities will, and that's why it was so fantastic to have such a great panel to start with. And it gets back to well-being, and it's not just simply um, uh, the, the, the idea that you go into town and uh, the, the kind of satisfaction that comes from buying something, but it's, it's, it's a well-being from, let's say, from education, um, not feeling lonely. You know, how much value do we put on our retired, our, our aging community to feel safe and not to feel lonely? There has to be a value in that, and I don't think we're doing it. There was a recent survey, 2019 World Happiness Survey. Britain went from uh, 18th place to 15th place, and they were using um, indicators such as yeah, income, but freedom, trust, health, life expectancy, social support, and generosity. I, think, I don't know how much we've got that valued in the UK at the moment. Um, the winners, or the winners, the top three, uh, Finland, Denmark, Norway. Don't think that would probably surprise us in that context. <coughs> so some, t some, some town, towns and cities in the UK offer some of that, but we can. I think we all know we can do better. And I think that's that's certainly where I would like to see uh, centres for cities helping us, and they are doing that by giving us a, that that evidence, that data, uh, to do better. So. Um, so the, as I say, the, capital, the private sector capital is fundamental to get this private sector capital back into the market. I think we've heard from the three local authorities this morning that the local, the local authorities can't do it alone. I'm afraid they're going to have to do more. There's not much more that Coventry can do, and Bradford and Swindon, to be honest, um, we've we'll been involved in the projects in, in, in a couple of those places. But there's a lot, a lot of public sector are still going to do more, not because, um, uh, not because they feel they, they want to do it for some ego reason, they're doing it because there's no other option. The private sector have walked away. 
um, and they continue to walk away. Yet there's a new private sector just over there saying we want to invest. So some are saying we want out of here, and other ones are saying we want to come back in. Yet there's not an alignment of that, and it's and, and the people who want to come in want also to get their money back out in three or five years' time. So we must take a longer-term approach to this, and that's where I would like the conversation to in, in both the the public sector to start to use similar language. So I think the future high street fund's been fantastic. It's probably 10%, 5% of what's actually going to be needed. 675 million, a lot more that's going to be needed to sort out the problems uh, that we've got in some of our vulnerable town centres. And not the ones on the Rebecca's graph that have big uh, dots here. It's the ones that have no dots, if you remember that diagram. And so we could get the, the, the valuation model, and, and I don't know, I don't think that's Greenbrook Treasury, by the way, to think about health and well-being and crime and bring that together and then, uh, and, and then somehow translate that back to the private sector who have to have a purpose, a purpose longer than five, longer than ten years uh, is what we're trying to encourage. So as, you know, um, from our perspective, the, the, the more our industry, the surveying industry, the property industry, um, the equity, the debt can stop thinking about IRRs and short term returns and start thinking more about purpose. And um, I don't know how we do that, but if you're a pension, you, if you have a pension, you're investing into a pension fund. Invest it into a pension fund that's got a purpose. Um, would would be my suggestion. And then hopefully some of that money will come back into our town centres, and we'll be able to fulfil some of the change that is so desperately needed. Because um, there's some fantastic locations. You just look at your window; it's jaw dropping, isn't it? But you go to some other places, and where do we even start? Um, so that's. Um, that's how uh, I'd just like to conclude that. Um, from Monty Gavin's perspective, thank you very much for uh, Centre for Cities for putting on such a fantastic event. Uh, I think we even didn't have enough seats. It was a sellout event. Um, and look forward to some questions. Brilliant. Thank you very much indeed. So, three panellists. Uh, now, firstly, tell me I'm wrong. Uh, if, I, if I'm not wrong, why is that? And what do we do to change that situation? Uh, you're right and you're wrong. Excellent. Good. Good um, in, in a big historical sense, it's entirely normal. Because if you look at how yes. cities have evolved, if you look at how cities, uh, look at you know, some of your medieval um, Italian towns and so on, the idea that you put in a really good structure of streets and squares and link them together, you put interesting things at the junctions where these things meet, uh, and that's the way you create an address for large amounts of new commercial activity. Yes. That's perfectly normal. So, as I mentioned, it's, it's London squares. So, so it's just we've forgotten a lot of this stuff because the way that um, property development works tends to be building by building. It tends to be egocentric. It tends to be about making a statement. Uh, and Brenly Place is not about single building. It's about creating... Um, a place, a, a wider place, and indeed, if you look at the history, um, you know part of that area was a scrapyard you know, 30 years ago, and it's car parking. Yeah. Uh, and this thing about quality. Um, well, but why hasn't that rolled out? I mean, I agree with all of that. Well, are, it's self-evident when, when you see it, but why is it rolled out? Of similar examples, right. parallel examples yeah. across the UK, and quite weirdly for me, I went to a place called Arkebrigger in Oslo. But it, they've come to a very, very similar solution. Slightly like different architecture, very similar structure on redeveloping part of the old dock center in Oslo. Yeah. So um, it's not unique by any means. Yeah. And indeed, if you look at what Argent have gone on to do with yes. Kings Cross, yeah. uh, you see Brindley Place, writ large, evolve, etc. Yeah. And they've also got a much more interesting historic fabric to work yeah. than we actually have here. Yeah. Um, so, um, so no, it's not unique. It's just not. Normal, I think, is the one. Right, so it's yeah, somewhere in yeah. between. Not quite um, exceptional, but and and the other sort practice. of sad okay. thing is, I've made much less money on Brindley Place than on a single office development in London that yeah. they're doing at the same time. Yeah. So what we've all got to realise, and they're quite open that, uh, yeah. that they've said yeah. what they've what learned, they've what they learned yeah. painfully yeah. through Brindley Place. You know, they adapted and took on to yeah. King's Cross. So for me, the main lesson yeah. of Brindley Place is having because it was done through a recession that you've set up a structure that can be implemented yeah. and evolved 
you're not dealing with one huge yeah. hit of investment, yeah. well, which is yeah. often the case. You're dealing with something where you can recycle the yeah. money. So you sell a housing yeah. block in order yeah. to get yeah. office blocks. King's Cross has yeah. done through a recession as well, which is yeah. kind of, you know, maybe it's down to them. Whenever they start the new development, think about the recession. It's either underway or on its way. <laughs> maybe that's <laughs> a new economic <laughs> forecast indicator. Yeah. Should we keep an eye? Where are you doing stuff that are about to start? <coughs> Alan, just, just pick up this point, because and don't say that everybody agrees that we need this kind of broader definition of value, right? So there's, you won the argument there and it's been espoused by lots of different people. From an investor development, you know, you work with these people every day, you're advising them, engaging with them. How do we make the step from a recognition that we need a broader definition to making that become something tangible and practical that we can move forward? So when we look back in five years' time, we're not still having the debate about Oh, play, you know, place making is really, really important. We need a broad definition of value. But yeah, no, what's your thought on that? In one way, it kind of connects to the previous question as well. One of the, you know, one of the reasons that Brindle Place and Arjun have been so successful is they had land to yeah. deal with. And in so many places, you know, in particular our town centres, it's got hundreds of owners of little bits and pieces who have all different objectives. Every shop and every high street has an owner with a different objective. Yeah. And, and you know, and that's you know, some local authorities have chosen to take control of their town centres. Some won't. It's you know, it's, it's different places, and it's great. Different places have different delivery plans and a different uh, catchment, and are driven by different agendas. Yeah. Not everyone should do the same. That's absolutely correct. Um, but in terms of um, uh, you know, assembling land, I think that's, well, that's going to be one of the most important challenges to us. And we're years and years away from being able to do that without, again, and that comes back to the public sector mm -hmm. information. So in terms of, um, in terms of moving forward, I, you know, I, I do, I genuinely think investors in some of these companies will start, and we're seeing it already, we're seeing it in, you know, the way we employ staff, we're seeing it the way uh, the, the, the world works, we're seeing it the way, you know, you know uh, how customers have flocked away from Philip Green businesses. Yes. That's not just because he's got the wrong brother, it's because they don't want to give their money to it. And I think we're going to see more of that purpose in the world, and that comes back to Jane said, they're driven by a different philosophy. Than, you know, it's not about the things doing things, and uh, sorry, it's not about buying things, it's about doing things. And they treasure their time differently, they treasure their, 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 their more, and certainly, we, certainly in my generation, they're more genuine, more thoughtful about that. So I think, you know, socially we're going to change, and socially we're going to say, that's not right. And, and I thought, I expect Matt, the, the, the company I invest in, will work for, to have some purpose, to have some uh, desire to improve the built environment. Um, and that's not going to happen everywhere, because we still want our pensions to be paid for, let's be honest. So we can't have it. Yeah. Um, but we also, we also yeah. want to live in a country that is um, um, got more to offer than just simply uh, we, can, we can live in our little white box and not worry about the environment around us. So I think, I think socially it's coming. And I think that's because investors are seeing to the companies they work for, I want something a bit deeper from this. Yeah, which raises a good question about whether, you know, Martin alluded to this earlier on, whether we, we want and should expect and encourage, you know, disruptors to, to come into the investment markets, into the real estate markets, because, you know, we get innovation and rapid change often from outsiders coming in rather than the incumbents that are often slow to respond. But Kay, you wanted to come in? Yeah, I, d I just wanted to talk about this uh, kind of development of individual buildings and the sort of red line boundary that exists around it. And I suppose my experience was working on the Olympic Park, where you think, oh yeah, it's all one, one operator, they're going to do everything. Well, actually, it was made up of a whole series of sponsors who had their budgets and their, their kind of red lines. And the, the only way that could be successful is a Place was to make them all buy into, you have to do this, you have to do this to make it <coughs> co join. So there's um, you know, a really big piece to do about getting those big stakeholders on board and saying, this is our bigger vision, you've got to buy into it, and this is what we need you to contribute towards it to make it work yeah. for you. Yeah. And, and I think that's a really important factor in particularly public realm which can be really expensive and making things join up. Yeah. And, and I'd also like to go back to a point that Martin made, which was about um, kind of pathways being blocked off. If you want to get people into places, you can't have temporary hoardings that prevent people actually getting to the places they want to go to. Because what you're trying to do is, over a period of time, 
you're trying to build up pathways for people to get there. And if you block them off temporarily, then suddenly you cut off that lifeblood. Yes, that's a very good point. And that, that, that one doesn't only apply to the, the scale of walking, it applies to you know how we use motorways in the past and very, very fast uh, car links and all the rest of it to destroy many of our city centres, but that's a story for another day. Um, questions and reflections. So I'm going to take one, two, and then we'll come back three. So, and then we'll probably, we may well be up against time. So, if you just say who you are, uh, and then uh, pause your question, and I'll get panelists answered. Yes. Uh, Robert Roderick, um, see it, really think tank. Um, I was interested, very interested in, in Rebecca's earlier um, diagrams about the, the size of opportunities and employment um, in Newport, South Wales. Because, uh, linked to what Kay was saying about the infrastructure, talking about. <coughs> 2050, where you're looking for not particularly the freight. But in Newport, South Wales, back in 1991, they were mooting the possibility of a ring road around Newport to save the congestion, help for, uh, business, save yeah. money, all that. 28 years on, a month ago, they decided with all the 